Welcome to the November 16th City Council Work Session. Welcome to everyone here and at home. We have two of our council um, Today we're going to be talking about the rest stop and Opportunity Village pilot programs. Assistant City Manager. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'm going to just turn it over to Ian Reagan. <clears throat> okay. We're here today to talk to you about the rest stop and OVE programs and the potential ongoing extension of those programs. And I also wanted to introduce someone I know that you're all familiar with, but she's in a new role. This is Reagan Watches, and she has been managing the rest stop program since Michael Kinnison moved to a different position within the city. So I'm going to turn it over to Reagan. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. So we thought with a sort of bird's eye view of different efforts to address housing and homelessness issues in our community. To give an idea of how and where the rest stop and OVE programs fit into these broader efforts. As you all know, there are many incredible service providers in our community. You see just a very small sampling of their logos up here, as well as those of other agencies that contribute to affordable housing and other services in the community, from Lane County to HUD and Oregon Housing and Community Services. The city is a proud partner and supporter of many of these organizations and agencies. The Poverty and Homelessness Board released their five-year strategic plan earlier this year. It includes a focus on availability supportive housing, shelter, and services, with a goal to create additional emergency shelter and respite care for homeless individuals, youth, and families with children. This includes 300 beds of emergency shelter for homeless singles, including year-round and winter season shelter. The takeaway from this slide is that there are agencies and community partners, including our own, working towards long-term solutions of more affordable housing and housing first units. There are also agencies that provide emergency shelter. But by providing temporary transitional shelter, the rest stops and OBE programs help to fill a gap for emergency shelter options. <clears throat> There are also a lot of ways that the city organization interfaces with and supports efforts around homelessness. Outside of rest stops and OVE programs, there are other ways the city provides services to the unhoused, including our public library and our parks and open, space, parks and open spaces. And there you'll see a picture of the Parks Ambassador Program. City departments such as EPD and Fire and EMS respond to calls for service. EPD's contract with CAHOOTS has been very successful in providing alternative responses to police dispatch calls. And CAHOOTS even recently expanded their hours of service and increased their capacity this year. Several city work groups also spend time responding to unsanctioned camping, particularly our parks and open space department, facilities, and EPD devote time and resources to addressing unsanctioned camping and to interacting with people who are experiencing homelessness. The city partners with St. Vincent de Paul to manage the car camping program, which allows homeless folks many places around the city to spend the night in their vehicles. Our affordable housing team works tirelessly on new affordable housing projects in our community, as well as preserving our current supply of affordable housing through rehabilitation projects. These are key long-term strategies. The division also supports capital facilities projects and has programs like the emergency home repair program that help prevent folks from becoming homeless in the first place. You also see initiatives here like the 15th Night Initiative, which connects and facilitates services for homeless and vulnerable youth. 404 veterans were housed through Operation 365 initiative last year. And the newly launched community court has shown early signs of success in helping some folks who go through that program to break the cycle of moving between homelessness and the criminal justice system. I know you all are pretty familiar with the OBE and rest stop programs, but we'll just do a brief overview of those programs for you. <clears throat> Opportunity Village is a tiny home community. It now operates under the umbrella of Square One Villages. The location is on public works property on North Garfield. It consists of small bungalows, Conestoga huts, and community spaces and in shared infrastructure, such as showers, laundry, a kitchen, and a heated yurt with computer access and library. Square One recently broke ground on North Polk and Railroad for their new Emerald Village Eugene, which will offer permanent low-cost housing for people with limited income. Each unit will include a bathroom and small kitchenette, 
and residents will pay rent and be able to pay to build equity as members of a housing cooperative. The rest stops provide shelter for up to 20 people at each site. We currently have two operators, community supported shelters and Nightingale Health Sanctuary, who are responsible for providing the on-site management and supervision. The rest stops consist of a mix of Conestoga huts and tents on platforms. Like OBEs, uh, sites are managed to provide structure that encourages personal health and growth, making safety a priority with rules around cleanliness, storage, visitation, and hours. Drugs and alcohol are uh, prohibited. Like OBE, they, uh, they have an application and a vetting process for potential residents. When accepting new residents, operators are mindful of group dynamics, and they work together to find the most suitable rest stop for an individual and existing rest stop. They each have a designated fenced area, portable restrooms, and trash service. A study on the rest stops in OBE by a community planning workshop at the University of Oregon concluded that the programs are working and that rest stops and Opportunity Village residents have more self-confidence, are be better able to provide for themselves, and feel as though they're part of a community. The study found that the programs are largely successful at helping residents transition into more permanent housing and that neighboring businesses and residents are very supportive of the programs. But it also concluded that the location of rest stops in Opportunity Village presents equity issues for residents and neighbors. There's a wide gap between the supply of affordable housing for low income and currently homeless people, as well as a shortage of emergency shelter for folks currently sleeping in unsafe, unsanitary, and unsanctioned places. The rest stops in OBE have helped to fill that gap. Their current maximum the first two slides went over some of the broader community and city efforts around homelessness, but we still see a high number of people on our streets. These programs have proven successful at providing needed stability for residents and enabling residents to more easily connect with social service and housing providers and vice versa. So now we'll go over uh, just a few numbers. Um, these numbers are based on the 2015 annual report on the rest stops and OBE. We'll have numbers for 2016 early next year. This was the first year of providing a comprehensive report like this, so uh, we can provide increasingly refined data if the program continues. Here are a few highlights. Rest stops and OBE served a total of 263 people in 2015, 214 at rest stops and 49 at OBE. <laughs> Nearly 75% of those entering rest stops and all but two entering OBE reported being from the Eugene Springfield area. The program served 58 veterans. 44% of those served reported that they had some form of disability or special need. 55 of those who departed rest stops or OBE moved into permanent stable housing, such as rental housing, Section 8, permanent supportive housing, or permanent situations with family or friends. In 2015, rest stop residents volunteered over 555 hours maintaining city parks, and OBE residents maintained the bathroom at Sladden Park for six months while it was open. Rest stops and OBE continue to host both local groups and many out-of-town and out-of-state folks who have an interest in learning more about the programs to gauge their potential use in their own communities. There is more statistical and demographic data in the annual report that was included in your packet and that can be found online. So here is a map of where um, OBE and the current rest stops are located. They are, current, they are all currently in Ward 7. Three of the rest stops in OBE are on city property and two rest stops are on the property of the Eugene Mission. Uh, I think you all know that a challenge since the program started has been finding additional locations for rest stops. When looking for eligible sites and evaluating parcels of city property, we've considered the factors of a site suitability for setup, access onto and off of the property, the criteria in the ordinance about proximity to residential areas and schools, whether and how portable restrooms and trash could be serviced, whether or not there's a hookup to water, and proximity to bus lines and transportation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mia. And I just wanna pause here for a moment because as recently as Monday, you've been hearing from folks throughout the community who have an interest
areas of the city. So we've been hearing from Southeast neighbors in particular, and they've been working really hard over the last several months and in, in conversations with staff and others about wanting to establish a rest stop site or more in, in their part of town. And then more recently, we've been talking with the Whitaker Community Council and folks that live in Ward 7 about the burden that they So because of homeless issues along the riverfront, which borders Ward 7, and the many social services that are located in that ward, such as the Mission, which serves up to 400 people in any given day, they, um, the, the impacts of strongly by that neighborhood able to alleviate some of that pressure, some of which may apply to this conversation today. There are two questions that we'd like the council to consider for discussion today, and those are, would the council like to continue the rest stop and OVE pilot programs? I think we've heard uh, clearly from you informally during other work sessions that and then does the council want to establish rest stop locations in each city council ward? And I think that there has been some interest in expressed uh, from some of you and certainly from the public. And so we have a recommendation about how that could happen if you wanna take that path. Um, we would do as staff some pretty serious rec uh, education and outreach. We have a tool that we'll show you here shortly in a video. Uh, what we know is that most of the community doesn't actually understand the program. And so we have some work to do to make clear what a rest stop actually looks like, how it operates, the benefits it provides. So we would um, we'd put together a staff team that would work with the community to help start building a stronger understanding of the program. And then uh, in the event that you're interested in establishing sites in each ward, we could put together a work group made of, of folks or businesses that live in that ward. And as we proposed in the agenda item summary, counselors could uh, propose some folks to be included in that conversation. And that the goal there would really be to help uh, the folks in the neighborhood who understand what it's like to live there, help them determine and provide a recommendation to council about what sites could work for any given neighborhood. And then uh, another recommendation is that these work groups would work with other neighbors so they wouldn't just talk amongst themselves. They'd be out in the neighborhood conducting outreach. This is different because it would be prior to us bringing you a site for approval. So previously we have brought you sites and upon your approval then we go out and do outreach with uh, the neighbors and then if that works we establish a site. So this would reverse that and we'd be doing conducting outreach prior to bringing you a recommendation for approval. And then finally, uh, we know that Nightingale Health Sanctuary that is currently located at the Mission needs to move in February. And so we recommend that we address the immediate need for an alternate site for them by allowing them to move to the first site identified. We've also talked with folks in Ward 7 about the option to move additional rest stops out of Ward 7 given the impact of homelessness there and two other sites as we identify them. And so with that, uh, we'd like to show you a video that we've prepared. Uh, we use this when, the intention is that this can be used for the many cities that come and visit us. We've had Fort Collins and Boulder and Salem and many, many others come and tour the rest stops and express interest in learning uh, how it works. And so we've put together a video that can be used for both that purpose and then education and outreach with the community if that's your interest. point-in-time count that's conducted by who have nowhere to go at night. Stuff's been defined by the community of Eugene. Is it for a homeless person to be in a position to where they can get to the resources they need to get to to become housed. I feel like rest stops are an incredible way um, to help people who have lost housing form community. Um, 
Unlike a shelter, the rest stops provide a place uh, for people to keep their things and really live uh, until they're able to transition into more permanent housing. A lot of the people who come into our program, they wouldn't have a chance to really improve their life if they, if they don't have a place where they could stabilize. And stability is the number one thing that our program offers, is, is an, a chance to get out of survival mode and get into thinking a little bit more about their immediate future instead of just thinking about day to day. About mid-2014, we met a couple under a bridge who was introduced to us by somebody that was staying at our veterans camp at the time. I was born in Eugene, and uh, we came out here for me to be with my family, and I was gone for 20 years, but I went to school here. Um, I love Eugene, I love Oregon. I absolutely want to stay here for the rest of my life. We were supported shelters, and them taking us in. We saw their vulnerability at the moment, and so we were able to quickly place them into our Roosevelt Safe Spot Camp, where the the, the husband eventually became groundskeeper, and she became our tour host. Since my husband stepped up to a management position, we had a little more time than the regular residents. So uh, he was volunteering his time as groundskeeper. I would help with little things around the camp, like doing the tour. First moved in, and now, and it's a remarkable change. While she was in her, our program, she got her tears. The early pictures, she's, she looks miserable and he uh, is able to um, work now. He started receiving his social security income, so now they're able to pay rent. They left feeling empowered and you know, ready to face life and, and move on to a new chapter in life. A long-term solution is actually providing permanent housing for these folks, um, and that is one of the key issues in Eugene, is the fact there isn't enough housing for folks who are on low income or homeless. We truly believe in um, Housing First, which is a model where if you can get somebody into housing and then do proper case management and give them all the skills they need to, to do well in that housing, then it's a far better model than even a shelter or living on the streets. I think a lot of the community's perception, yeah, they think of garbage, they think it's empowered, they are friendly, our camps are tidy, organized, clean. They are transitional locations. These are intended to give the people that are in them the time to get into permanent housing or to get into situations to where they can get a source of income to be able to provide housing for themselves. It provides the time for them need to do to get on to permanent stable housing. We vet people, we talk to people before they come in. We don't let everybody in. If people are obviously under the influence of drugs or come back another time because we don't allow alcohol or drugs in the safe spot. All of these rules are in place and the on-site management is in place in order to uh, make sure that the rest stops are good neighbors to the neighboring businesses and residents. We've had an independent study by the University of Oregon found neighboring businesses and residents from the rest stops. Um, they found that most around the rest stops tend to be supportive and uh, continue to feel that their neighborhoods are safe. What I've noticed is that our issues are probably more prevalent when rest stop is not here. Uh, we, we haven't had very many issues. We seem to have less people in the area. We've never had an issue related to the rest stop camps and we've had them probably within uh, you know I'm we got on our feet with with help the vision for us is that that everybody without shelter would have uh, some place that where they can legally sleep no matter what their their individual challenges and it's going to really take the whole community to get behind that vision to make it work because it it's a big it's a struggle to, to find places, especially in, in different neighborhoods besides along the train tracks. Helping to diversify the, the, the land where the, our community's overall strategy with dealing with homelessness um, become much more successful. Well, my hope for the future is that we have more housing for people that's affordable. But in the meantime, we need to find a permanent spot 
Moving every six months is a tremendous burden on the people who live here. They've had enough challenges in their life. With Gateway out of homelessness for people, and they minimize the impacts of illegal camping. I am willing to be a neighbor to one of these rest stops, and I would, I would probably get involved with some supportive uh, opportunity, whether that may be helping them to get water or uh, some of the rest stops are doing mentor programs. Uh, I would welcome members of the rest stop in my neighborhood association and their feedback into community planning. It's been a really positive collaboration and we just feel great about helping these folks get off the street um, on their way to hopefully permanent housing and permanently getting out of homelessness. And that's what we're all about. It's just a wonderful place to heal and get back on your feet. It's beautiful. <laughs> so we'll turn back to these questions and uh, Again, today what we hope to learn from you is whether or not you want to move forward with the program and whether or not you'd like to establish additional sites and locations in each ward. Thank you. So I've got um, Alan, Mike, Claire, George Poli, and George Brown in the queue, but I'm going to say a couple things first. You want to be in the queue too? Okay, there. Um, First of all, I just uh, want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to Community Supported Shelters and Nightingale for the work that you've done to provide those safe spots. I want to say thank you to Square One for uh, taking the chance on trying to support a, a village of people that people could live in safely. I just think you can't overestimate. I remember talking to a woman at um, uh, Opportunity Village and asking her how it was to be there between the police and public works and she said it's such a relief I feel safe and I haven't felt safe in a long long time so I just want to say thank you for that and then I want to especially call out the role of the community and I actually think it's been one of the most important things as part of our rest stop program has been they're not government programs they are we're a partner but it really comes out of the community and it wouldn't happen without the community support in so many ways so I just think it's a really important partnership that is shared and the more we can share things as a community the more they're likely to, to succeed and then I want to just emphasize I thought the film was wonderful and I hope we get to show it to lots of people um, I just think that um, the success of these rest stops has been uh, beyond my expectations and they haven't had uh, a lot of negative impact of what goes on inside them or outside of them and I think that's that speaks very very highly of them and I think the oversight we're grateful for the oversight that has been on them um, and uh, the, and the community building that's been part of what's in them. There's a lot of places that have shelter, but they don't have community building. And community building is part of recovery for a lot of people and helping them find their way, uh, their pathway forward. So I think these things are really important. And I also want to say, um, I know in the PHB plan, and I hope that's something we're going to join strongly in, is a setting a goal for 600 new affordable housing units in the next five years. I think that's a really important thing that we can do to, to do, get this housing first model um, moving forward. So thank you all very, very um, much for all the roles that people in this room have played. And thank you to the council, actually, because... I couldn't do it if there wasn't a space to do it on. So um, we're, we're very, and I, I guess I should thank the mission because they provided space for um, a couple of them as well. So good work, everybody. And, and I think we're looked at as kind of, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And we're looked at as kind of unique in the world. I don't think anybody else is doing this. So this is a demonstration of, of a step into uh, more permanent housing. All right, Alan, you're next. Yeah, uh, amazing work that's been done it, 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 by so many people to make Opportunity Village and the rest stops work. As the mayor said, you know, it's not only community supported shelter, but the city staff that's worked on it and, and the council getting this ball rolling and square one and mission and, and there's so many citizens that stepped up to the plate. 
you know, this isn't a city project. This is a community project, and it's very, very clear that 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 it is a community project. I requested this work session back in July, actually. And the questions that I wanted to get addressed were how successful was the OVE pilot? What were the pros and cons? I think we've seen it's very successful. Can we apply the affordable housing dispersal, dispersal model and seek new opportunity village type sites in each ward except Ward 7, which already has all of them? Are there any code or policy restrictions to expand Opportunity Village Pilot in other wards? Does the current code allow for micro housing units? Are there density requirements in the residential areas that maybe need to change or exempt it? Can we get community partners to develop sites as we did with Opportunity Village? What city resources would be necessary to expand the Opportunity Village Pilot and what would be the appropriate timeline? And how would we, maybe most importantly, how would we get community buy-in for expanding the OV pilot um, and this uh, that video was awesome I hope everybody gets to see it. Uh, it, it it was so well done and such a positive powerful message and uh, what it really shows is that um, they're not only a problem in the communities, there haven't been any problems, but they're actually a positive impact on the communities. Uh, as noted by the 550 hours of, of volunteer work that where they worked in the parks and bathrooms and things like that, uh, it's just it's simply amazing what, what these things have actually done. Um, uh, and I absolutely believe we should continue the, the, these programs and expand them using the housing dispersal model for affordable housing around the city. Um, and and uh, as we do with that policy, we don't say, it, we don't allow them all to be clustered in one area. We spread them around, uh, which is fair and equitable. Um, and I've often said that, that uh, there's no silver bullet to homelessness or climate change for that matter, but, uh, but Opportunity Village and the rest stops are part of that silver buckshot we need in order to, to alleviate homelessness in our community. I'll personally work with anyone in my ward who wants to find a site for a, a mini housing village and work with them. I'm, I'm all in on that. So that's my pledge. Um, and and uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more, maybe a Reagan or someone else who's here, talk a little bit more about the details of the new Square One Village that's, that's uh, started and where the money came from and, and what's being done there and how many people. And I know a lot of the money has come from private donations and grants. Um, I think it's a little smaller, maybe 22 units, a little smaller than OVE. Um, I don't know that I can speak a, a whole lot more. I mean, the, it's a step up from Opportunity Village and that each unit will have um, uh, bathroom and kitchenette. So it's meant to be each in each unit, exactly. So it's meant to be permanent housing if people want to use it that way. And building equity allows the um, folks who might want to move on to cash out their, you know, their shares and, and move into a um, different type of housing if they'd like. Um, yeah. We can provide you additional information. Just one more comment that reset the clock. Just that that vision of what that is and what Opportunity Village is, is what we're trying to get at. I think people have in their mind the Occupy illegal encampments that they had is what was going on, and that's not what we're trying to do here. Hey, next up is Mike. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a couple of pieces of the things that I, that we're hearing on this that create some cognitive dissonance, and I just kind of want to... I want to kind of work through that, mostly because uh, in the last iteration of uh, the place for Nightingale, we had a, a piece of property in my ward, and I had quite a lot of input from neighbors. And I want to be able to talk with them about this differently than I've been able to before. So I, I want to ask a couple of things. Number one, um, I, I saw this as advocacy, and it seemed that because in the, in the piece, Reagan said we need more rest stops. So is that what the staff is telling the council as an advocacy piece that we need to add more? I picked up on that too. Um, and so I think what staff is trying to do is fulfill kind of the policy direction around creating places for homelessness. And we found that the home, that the rest stop is working and it's working pretty well in the neighborhoods. And so um, are we advocating? I think we're trying to hit that sweet spot, which has been kind of the 
And if I could, if, if in <laughs> fact that is, you know, the thing you're trying to say to us, I would have appreciated hearing more about the demand so I can explain that to other people when they talk to me about it. I would have appreciated saying we have a waiting list of X. You know, we, we've had people approach us with a place to be and they, they're just, we just don't have enough to serve. You know, more information around the demand would be helpful. Number two, and more importantly, this is the really big one. There's a gentleman sitting behind me over here that I heard from the wit on Monday night <laughs> and, and a number of people talked on Monday night about the, their experience with the rest stops in, in their area. Um, I've heard everybody in, at, who talks about this here at this table talk about how, well, it's gone, there are no problems, there are no issues, but there's a confused language here because everything I heard from people who didn't want more of them in Ward 7 talked about the problems that they experienced. and. I get the equity piece, that's fine, that makes sense. And we have the housing dispersal policy for a reason. But I heard Mia say, use the words, share the burden. And I'm trying to figure out what the burden is. And I'm trying to pay appropriate respect to the people who are saying, hey, not so many in our ward, and square that with, it's working perfectly, everybody loves it and there's no problems. So um, um, can you, Give me some help here. I mean, I heard specifics the other night on Monday night, gunshots. I heard, you know, so somebody help me square this a little better, please. So burden was probably not the best term to choose. Uh, but what I will say is that we have been having conversations with folks that live in the neighborhood that borders the current neighborhood that's home to the rest stops. So three of the rest stops are in the train song neighborhood. Two are now at the mission, which are in the Whitaker neighborhood. And could I, could I apologize for interrupting, but oh, sure. I stopped you right there. Cause I know that I know what the objection is going to be the folks in my wards. Cause I've already done that. Okay. And in an effort to try and be able to communicate with those folks well, how would you have me answer that when folks who already have some of these in their ward right now are saying don't do more? Yeah, I was getting to that. I'm sorry. So I think what we have learned in having the conversations with the folks who are experiencing the impacts of homelessness, not necessarily just the rest stops, it's very hard for either us as the city or for them to know whether the impacts are from illegal camping or from the actual rest stops. And I think that folks, even some that testified on Monday because I've heard them say that, that they know that the rest stops are well run. However, it's very hard to distinguish between the homeless folks that are living in rest stops and the homeless folks that are who don't have a sanctioned place to sleep. And there are there's a large homeless population in the vicinity of the neighborhood where rest stops are sited because of its proximity to the riverfront and other areas. Okay. So I guess I would ask in the last few seconds here what our responsibility is. I Actually, I'm going to take a second round if I could, please, Mary. Yep. Um, Claire, you're next. Thanks. And I might be able to address some of Councillor Clark's question and I'll probably need a second round. Um, so thanks for the presentation, great video. Uh, the rest stops and OVE are just one piece of a larger strategy um, for dealing with homelessness, but they are playing an important role in the effort to reduce homelessness and illegal camping. Um, and I really suggest, uh, re appreciate staff's suggestions for educating the public about the benefits of this program. I think there's a lot of misperceptions. And I strongly support the steps you outlined for the program, including the neighborhood work groups and finding a permanent site for Nightingale Health Sanctuary. I think we need to make this a, a permanent part of our homelessness strategy. I suggest we focus on creating more rest stops in preference to Opportunity Village type sites, just because I believe there was a very heavy lift in getting OVE off the ground, and I think the rest stops are slightly less work intensive overall, not a lot, but a little. Um, and I just want to note we received an email um, from a train song resident who lives pretty much right next door to our very first rest stop on Roosevelt and Garfield, who was very supportive of the program and felt that he had not personally experienced any negative impacts from the rest stop. But I. Uh, we do need to implement a dispersal policy that's perhaps based on some kind of rationale. Um, 
you know, I've been having a conversation uh, with folks from the Whitaker Community Council, and one suggestion was perhaps limit how many emergency shelter beds the city can site in each ward. Uh, and I agree with testimony from representatives of the WCC that concentration of services, including rest stops, in a particular area can create a cumulative negative impact on a neighborhood. So while an individual rest stop may not have any negative impact, having five plus the mission plus the illegal camping does uh, have a cumulative effect of overburdening a particular neighborhood or area of town. So I think that's what I was hearing from the Whitaker Community Council representatives. They are very supportive of the program. They would like to see it replicated in other wards because they recognize that it helps reduce illegal camping, but they don't want it all just to be in Whitaker and Trainsong. Um, I think we should um, stick with the 20 person limit on the number of tent sites allowed. Uh, again, concentration I think is an issue and not put two rest stops in close proximity to each other because that starts to create that cumulative effect. Um, and we need to provide funding for our program, including dedicated staff time. And then I'll take a second round, Mayor. Okay, George Pollen, you're next. Thank you, yeah, I, I agree that the uh, rest stop and OBE programs do need to continue. I think we've made some pretty good um, ventures in, in addressing the, the issues there, but I, I do think they need to continue. I do think we do need to expand. Um, However, I do have uh, some concerns. Uh, first of all, the video, I think, was was well done. And before we move forward, I think that video needs to be taken to every single neighborhood association meeting and shown to them. And at the same time, ask for volunteers to contact their counselors if they want to work on, a com on one of these committees. Um, you know, we could go and, and, and pick people, but I think if you go to the neighborhood association meetings, these are the people that are involved in their neighborhoods on a regular basis. I think you're going to get the people willing to work uh, on these issues. Um, you know, I, I'm glad to see that one of the recommendations is to work with committees, and I'm assuming that's the committee that, that the counselors will form, uh, would be include identifying eligible properties, et cetera, et cetera, because there are some properties that look pretty good, but when you start digging into it, you find that there's major issues that can't be overcome, unfortunately. And then I understand the concerns of the residents of Ward 7 uh, about basically piling on and also trying to distinguish the activity from people within the rest, rest stops versus the illegal campers and the common citizens not, not really able to figure out which is which. However, I have a little problem with that fourth bullet point, and that is, um, the, therefore, commit the first newly identified sites as locations that existing rest stops can move to, thereby alleviate, alleviating some pressures to those neighborhoods. We're grossly under, um, we don't have enough housing as it is now. Why would we shut down a rest stop that's currently operating and move it if we find another place? It's just gonna put us out that much further in the hole. I, again, I understand the concerns raised by the people in Claire's Ward, but you've got them established there, you've got them operating, don't shut it down and just cause that many more needed beds for, for the community. And put me in the second round just in case. Okay. Uh, George Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation. That was really a nice video. Um, well, I'll just go or start with the questions. Yes and yes. Should the council continue the rest stops and the OVE? Yes. And we should probably re think about removing the sunset date because council can always change that later, uh, you know, two years from now, assuming some unknown problem develops, council can just go, okay, well, we changed our mind. But I, that would be one thing, just make it permanent until until housing is built for everybody. And that's, we all know that's gonna be many years off. So I think it should just be made permanent. Uh, should we establish rest stops in each ward? Yes, they should be dispersed. And um, 
Education and outreach is key. And this video would be a very useful thing. And I think that's a good idea of, of uh, showing that at all of the neighborhood association meetings. And I also think that, yes, forming a, a working group in each ward is a good idea, kind of like the Southeast neighbors have already done so. And, and um, that would be a, a good thing. And um, I will tell you, along with that video, interested parties in each ward should also take a tour of, you know, and go to community supported shelters and go with Eric and Faye or uh, Lloyd and go and um, actually tour them. And, and because there's still a lot of uh, stereotypes to be overcome that it's pretty common people have, um, you know, they're, they see about the illegal camping in the parks and down by the river and they think it, it's all, all like that. And they, I think there's uh, memories of the Occupy encampment at Washington Jefferson. There's images of, like you showed in the video, needles and trash, and but the rest stops aren't that way. <laughs> There's a complete opposite. And so um, I think the, the working group in, in, in the ward should be composed of residents and businesses and also schools. I, I think maybe we might need to relax some of the, since we have such a good track record with, with the rest stops and OVE, I think that they could be established closer to schools. I don't mean right next door, but closer. Maybe some of the some of the restrictions, because we didn't know how it was going to work out, but now we see it's working very well. That some of those earlier restrictions could and possibly should be relaxed. So, um, and also, I just that's pretty much it. But I'm just. I mean, you know, imagine what the, we've heard about Ward 7, and yes, they're all concentrated there. That was because that was easy pickings, because there was a lot of vacant city land there. Um, but imagine what the impact of Ward 7 would be without the mission and the rest stops. Thank you. If they weren't there, what would it be like? Chris, you're next. Thank you. Um, uh, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think it's it's very um, wise, and, and I appreciate the report. Um, to specifically to the two questions, um, I agree. Uh, we should not only continue the rest stop and OV pilot programs, we should eliminate the sunset. We should make them permanent. They work, they work successfully, they need to be made permanent. Um, as to the second question, uh, yes, absolutely, they should be in every ward in the community. In fact, I have already spoken with the Churchill area neighbors and they voted um, to begin to actively work to find a rest stop in Ward 8. And I will work with them, regardless of the outcome of the meeting today, I'm going to actively work with the people in my ward, similar to the committee that's being proposed, and we will find a location in Ward 8 to cite a rest stop, um, because there's that much interest. Uh, I must emphasize that this is one piece of a larger strategy. Serving on the Housing Policy Board um, brings very clearly into light the fact that this is not the end of the road. This is actually closer to the beginning of the road. And if we focus too much on this as an isolated strategy and not part of a larger effort, um, we'll lose track of what the whole point is and why it's trying to work. And to that reason, I very much support the recommendations in the review of transitional housing strategies in Eugene. And this is the first one to uh, revise the rest stop ordinance to clarify its intent and how it fits into the overall context of what we're trying to do, along with the rest of those recommendations. I think you should go back and review them because they are really very good. Um, I think the issue of having them all concentrated in Ward 7 is um, probably less a burden based on some sort of a problem than it might be one around the equity of just having them all in one place. I remember when I was the executive director of the Red Cross, one of the first cardinal rules of sheltering is don't put too many people in one shelter. And at Katrina, they learned this in the, the dome was they put everybody in one place and it created an enormous problem. Good people do bad things when you put them in a bad situation. And so by making rest stops the size they are and the distribution they are, I think you can relieve a lot of potential problems um, just by virtue of doing that. And so it is, it's not an equitable situation to have them all in one ward. They should be distributed. Um, so with all of that in mind, um, whatever we need to do to create more rest stops and have those rest stops. And I would be supportive of more OVE locations because once again, they are part of that continuum, um, I think would be extremely valuable. And then we can also then pick them up in the affordable, the workplace and the market rate housing and, and make that entire continuum 
easier to move along than creating the huge gaps that people can't overcome because they can't get from one part of it to the next part of it. And that is what our role is, is to make sure each step is manageable and easy. Thank you. So I, a couple of things that I want to say, then we have a round two here. Uh, it seems to me that your uh, video could really, maybe we can get some uh, t television stations to p play it for free. PSA. And it seems like a reasonable community support kind of thing to, to try to do. And I think repeating, repeat easy access shows that that could, could be a game, a game changer. The other idea I have is I think it's a little, for some people, it's a little bit off putting to think of getting themselves over to the rest stops. So you may want to give them a place where you put, get, put them in a, a bus or something and take them and return them uh, to another spot. It's just one way of helping people have that experience in a way that they, they feel um, easier about, I think. And uh, on your item number two here, because I think I'm, we're going to ask, uh, when we're done today, we're going to ask uh, for actual votes on these things. And I'm a little concerned about language, because I don't want mm -hmm. uh, the language to say, we are going to put this on you. I think it, I want it to say this is something that your counselors and would like to work with you on to come up with how your ward uh, could address this issue. We, you could pass a motion that says we, the council, support a dispersal policy, but how that plays out could depend on the conversation individual counselors have with their ward. So I don't know how we do that language, but it does seem important in that we decided that we're going to do what we're going to do together as opposed to we're going to do it to you. So I... Good, good point. Yeah. Very good point. Okay. Mike, you're up next. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity for transition there. That's kind of exactly what I was going to say is when I look up here, I want to say yes to one and to two, I would say yes, but, and I would take off on a couple, in a couple of ways from what the mayor said. Um, I, I would also say there's there's another issue here that while I get that rest stops and and the camps aren't the sole answer, I've heard Alan say that a time or two. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there are a lot of people for whom making that effort and making other efforts, they still want to see how do we get to the end of some of the problems that we have. So, for example, to the degree that you could tell me um, establishing more rest stops decreases or could end illegal camping, especially on our river, you change the response. We're not having this conversation the way I think we should be, which is how do we get to solving the larger problems with this as one of the tactics or one of the strategies, okay? So... I, I think you'd, you'd find yourself with a lot more supporters amongst the, those you wouldn't imagine are supporters if we had the ability to talk about it that way. One of the concerns along that line of thinking is that the, the I don't know, three years ago, the annual winter homeless count, count was 2,100, and then it was 19, and then it was 1,700, and last year it was 1,487. I, I don't remember the exact number. It was 14-something, right? And if we've all agreed that you're going to have 20 people as a maximum in any particular place, how many camps are we talking about? And the reason that's a valid question is because I, I, I heard Claire, consolidation is when you have problems. Or I, I suppose that's a way we could interpret what we heard from people in Ward 7 and in the wet who are saying, well, when they're mixing with folks who are camping illegally and the folks who are being served well and who are doing well inside the rest stops, that's maybe where there's some interaction problems. I think we have a responsibility on two fronts. Number one, how can we make the case that we're making illegal camp camping go away? And number two, what's our responsibility at the point where we get over condensed? And what's that look like? What's, what is that number? How many camps per ward is too many before we have problems? And it's an overburden. Those are the tougher questions. But if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna meet the natural resistance of folks who say not in my area, 
we have to be prepared, I think, with this kind of information. So it's the, it's the kind of stuff I'm, I want answers to. And I'd like a next round, too, please, Mayor. Let's see how we do. Um, Claire. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think those were good points, Councillor Clark. Um, so continuing and, and addressing some of those things, I think uh, I agree. I th we need to consider removing some of the restrictions we placed on this program when it was brand new and we didn't know how it was going to work. I think undeveloped parks, vacant commercial land that might be adjacent to a residential area should be considered. In these locations, the rest stops would actually help mitigate illegal camping, vandalism, and other negative activities that tend to occur in these types of locations. And we had testimony from a Santa Clara resident on Monday night whose property is adjacent to the rest stop we had considered placing in an undeveloped park there, who was eager to see the rest stop come because she viewed it as a positive way to displace the illegal activity that's been occurring on the other side of her fence for 10 years, according to her testimony. You know, so I think if we could double our sites, we could make a significant impact on illegal camping. I, I absolutely agree, Councillor Clark. Um, in my mind, if we had enough sites to accommodate all of the people engaged in illegal camping now, we would be providing a humane, safe place for people to be, and that would put us in a much better position to enforce our camping ban in our parks and the riverfront without being accused of violating people's human rights. And that is a goal I am willing to work towards. Um, and lastly, I also have worries about the request to close current sites if we find new sites, and I'm not advocating for that at this time. Um, but if we are successful in finding a number of new, uh, finding and establishing new sites, then I think we should use that opportunity to relocate maybe all but one of the current sites in Whitaker Train Song. And I'll just note, they're not just all in Ward 7, they're all within I think about three quarters of a mile of each other. Right. Trains on Whitaker, very concentrated, um, and so that's part of the challenge as well. So I think it's important for us to keep this request from the Whitaker neighbors in our minds as we go forward in looking for new sites. George Poling. Thank you. Yeah, as far as the criteria is concerned, I, I'm not willing to allow it in uh, developed parks. And I have some real major concerns about the undeveloped parks. Uh, I know Mike and I, our wards, are, we don't have we don't have enough park area as it is for people to use. So the one uh, undeveloped park that we do have in our ward, Strike the Park, is being used as a park by the people in the area, even though it's undeveloped. The, the neighborhood, uh, the neighbors in that area are trying to work with the city to get it developed, and they're using the, the property as a as a park as it is anyway. So I, I've got mixed feelings about using undeveloped park areas. Um, you know, the impacts of homelessness is, obviously it's probably more pronounced in Ward 7, but it's also, you know, it's also present in all awards. Uh, you know, the other side of the river is on my ward and in Mike's ward. And I hear from people constantly about trying to walk down the, the bike trail through Alton Baker Park and having to run the gauntlet there of the illegal campers. So the, the impact of homelessness is not just in, in Ward 7, it's throughout the entire city. And then the housing dispersal policy, I know we're trying to figure out some equation on that. Uh, I have some concerns about how that's being used for the affordable housing as opposed to housing that's affordable. The affordable housing projects, because from Coburg and Willa Kinsey, within probably a mile there's five, six, affordable housing projects alone, hundreds and hundreds of units of affordable housing. It seems like it's all concentrated in, in that area. Now, I know we're talking apples and oranges, but when we try to look at a some sort of a, a dispersal policy, I think we need to take that into consideration. Alan? I agree with everything that everybody said so far. Um, and uh, I, at this point, I think I'll put some motions out um, I'll, I'll do them in a series of, of four motions based on, on what I've heard and what um, uh, the staff has proposed here. Uh, and the first one's not one of the bullets, but it's the overarching thing that I guess it'll be Betty, then it would, would be George. You. So uh, the first one's uh, not part of the bullets that were in the AIS, but it, it's something that I've heard. So uh, I move that. Uh, we recognize that the Opportunity Village, Eugene, and Rest Stop pilots have been successful. Uh, 
that the sunset should be eliminated and that the siting criteria be reviewed for modifications. Second. Moved and seconded, Mike. Yeah, Mayor, I, I, I'm happy to support the intent of what you're trying to say there, but I, I don't think it's I don't think it's advisable for us to gloss over the point that I wanted to make in round three, which you're addressing with one of those. That we make a statement that they have been successful. That's true, but to a point, because we've already said, and this is why I was trying to hit this this issue of of the conflict here. But they're not successful if they're too if they're if they're clustered too close together or too many in one ward. That's why we're talking about this the importance of the dispersal policy. So that's actually not true if we're going to be if we're going to have too many or they're going to be done too densely in one ward. So fine, that's great. I, I want to find out where that that appropriate level is and know what it means in context of being able to solve the problem overall before we're making these kind of pronouncements. So in other words, right now we've got four in Ward 7. Let's say, for example, you know, if, if you take this to the nth degree and we say that 1,500 people a night is the, is the outside of solving the problem, because we, we know that from the count, then we're talking about 75 camps citywide, so we're talking about roughly almost 10 per ward. And I, I, I think based on knowing that four is difficult and we, we want to spread them around, the question is how, how many is too many, under what conditions? And, and the only reason this is important to talk about is because we don't have, we don't have a, an idea about how this goes from here. I get, again, what you said, this isn't the only solution, but it's part of the solution. I, I understand that. But we need to be having, I think, a conversation so that it's in appropriate context when we're making a blanket statement that they've been successful. So I'm, I'm not ready. I want to I want to be clear about the fact that when I vote no on this, it's because it's too blanket a statement that doesn't cover the important parts of this that we need to be talking about. So something, Kathy? Um, so regarding the portion of the motion about um, removing the sunset, that would be through an ordinance, so it would be a direction to the city manager to schedule a public hearing to do that, just for clarification. So I am looking to staff. Do you feel like there's more discussion and information that needs to be had before we move to uh, an ordinance change? Well, I think what we're looking for Really what we're looking for today and what we need to move forward in the coming weeks to find an, to find an alternate site for Nightingale Health Sanctuary, which is our priority as we stated, would be a direction in your interest to look at other sites. The current ordinance sunsets in March, and so we could look at making ordinance changes between now and then um, rather than needing to do that today. Yeah. Well, the motion doesn't do it today, so just that we shall do it, should eliminate, which is a process unto itself because it's an ordinance with no time frame on it. Okay. Uh, the only comment I will make, and then I'm going to call on Claire, and you are in the queue if you want to say something else, um, is that every homeless person that we count on one night is not a can necessarily a candidate for a, a rest stop. Some of those people will stay, some of them will go. Also, some people we hope that they don't have to stop in a rest stop before they get into housing. So, I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a broader um, it's a broader picture of how that number of people can have their needs dealt with and so there's not a finite number that you're going to put on how many rest stops uh, you would have in the community i personally would think we would if we did brown breaker if we could just get a few more <laughs> a few more and then have more success and then a few more i don't want to scare this community out of its head that we think that there's going to be a gazillion rest stops every everywhere so just just saying that. Okay. Um, Claire, you're next. Yeah, and I, I, 
I think that's important, and um, my comments may not change Councillor Clark's vote, but I think for me the distinction about the statement that the pilot project has been successful is the distinction is that individual sites and Opportunity Village have been successful in providing humane uh, emergency shelter for homeless residents with minimal impact on existing residents. But where we have not been successful is regarding the implementation in terms of a variety of locations and, and a dispersal throughout the community. So I think insofar as we set out to create an opportunity for people to have alternatives to illegal camping, we have been successful in terms of our role in finding sites um, in other places besides Whitaker and Trainsong and re resulting in that concentration effect, we have not been successful. So that's not a ding on the rest stop itself. Alan? Yeah, just a couple of comments. One is that the silver buckshot comment is, is very relevant here. The, yeah, so the, the, the rest stops and, and opportunity village type housing with micro housing in them is part of the solution. It's not the solution. I, I don't want to scare the community either into thinking that we're going to have 10 of these per ward all over the city. We're going to, let's get one in each ward as a start and, and see how that goes and make sure that this works. Let's ease our way into it. We've got some success with the, with the pilots. Let's, let's, let's replicate them in the other parts of the city except for Ward 7. And so um, that's what the intent behind it is. Um, and, and the motion says recognize that the OVE and rest stop pilots have been successful. It's the we're talking about the pilots, not about the, the, the uh, all the other issues. But those have been successful, and that we should sun eliminate the sunset. The time frame for that, of course, includes a public hearing and all that kind of stuff. And that the criteria need to be reviewed about where we cite these. We I think we were too restrictive about that. I agree. We don't want to put them into uh, developed parks. That would be that would be silly. That would uh, I think. Uh, that intense of a use would uh, would would uh, help destroy our investment that we've made in those kind of parks. But there are other places that we can look that we restricted uh, previously that uh, maybe we want to look at now. So revising and looking at those and modifying those, I think it should be one of the things we do on, on the front end of this because that will inform the, the next motion, which is established committees. I've got Mike and Chris in the queue, and then we're going to vote. Thank you, Mayor. I I would vote in favor with the friendly uh, amendment to this that you say that they are successful for those residents who've taken advantage of them. And I'm fine with that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, good, excellent. And we're on the same page with that. My point in the things that I've raised is, is that I think we alleviate fears. I think you're right, Mayor. I don't want to scare the community. That's kind of my point. And I think the way we do that is with transparency. I think the way we do that is by talking really openly about what it is we anticipate seeing happen. And so when we say, gosh, this is wonderful, these are all working, but some people still see a lot of illegal camping that has negative effects, the there's a cognitive dissonance and they want to hear about that. That's, so I'm, I'm saying let's do this intelligently by making sure we're talking about the larger um, policy context of, of solving the whole problem so that the community doesn't get inordinately afraid. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, just quickly. I mean, the, the, the question was, should we continue the pilot programs? I think it was a pilot and we've proven the pilot has worked. Um, I think the pilot has been successful, so we should initiate the process to take it from a pilot program into a permanent program. And I do agree with the notion that it has to have a purpose. It's what you do and how you do it. And there will still be things to work out about the how you do it. I completely agree. But what we're doing, I still think, is fundamentally a good thing. And I like the notion that by providing positive and safe places for people to camp, you are working then to eliminate the unsafe, unpositive places for people to live. I would like to see that um, become an equation. Whereas we provide good places for people to live, we eliminate the bad places for people to live. So I would, that, to me, would be part of the ultimate goal of this program. Um, I think camping along the river for a host of reasons is not a good strategy. It's illegal, it's unsanitary, it's unsafe, and it damages the environment. Um, but I need to provide the alternative. And for me, that's the goal of what we're doing is creating that alternative. So if that's what you're saying, I agree with you completely. And I think what we're proposing to do is a step in that direction. Okay, ready to vote. All those in favor of Allen's motion, please indicate. 
one, two. Uh, as as amended. finally amended. As, uh, yes. Okay, there's six of you in favor and nobody in opposition. It passes. Next. Uh, I move the city shall help build community understanding of the programs through education and outreach. Staff will work with community groups, neighborhoods, and residences to clarify purposes of the programs and dispel misunderstanding, especially by showing the video. Okay. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Mike? Just the question. When can we come back, I suppose, since it, it wasn't at all clear to me that we need a second uh, work session on this. I, I heard us say maybe we should, but we want to act on these things Alan wants to, to make motions on. So my question is, when can we please come back and talk about this some more? Because there's further detail in the motion he just made that needs to be dealt with, too. We need to be talking about what's the saturation level per ward, what's, what's the ceiling, and why. And then what does that leave in the way of our inability to to enforce illegal camping, and what do we do about it? Those are the unaddressed questions here that I, I, I think we, in order to be responsible, we need to be dealing with all of it. Um, Catherine? Uh, just for clarification, I, um, I understand the motion to be not, that, not a direction to staff, but to direct the city manager to work with the community groups. Is that, would that be accurate? Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, George Brown. I just want to um, one just briefly. I, you know, I, I, I think, Mike, that you that you want too much information right now. <laughs> I think I think you're you're projecting too. too <laughs> with all due respect, yes, yes. And out of friendship, you're you're looking too far ahead. I mean, what we're all we're trying to do now is is facilitate. Well, it's good to look ahead. Yes, sir. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I, I like to do that, too. But, but I mean, <laughs> we're, we're, our goal is simpler here, is, is the goal is to establish other rest stops in other neighborhoods. We know, you know, it's been, what, three years since uh, Opportunity Village and the rest stops. So, and, and it's seemed for, agonizingly slow to me sometimes, and yet we've actually made pretty good progress. And it, and. It, and, and establish the really nice bedrock foundation. That so our next step is just to trans, you know, to, to start at least one. We'll just start with one in the other, in the other wards, and we'll see where that goes. And then we'll evaluate that a year or two years or three years from now. By which time many of your questions will probably be answered. But I don't know that we can get too fine grained with this and. Say well, okay. We opened up three new rest stops, and therefore, well, there's a, a 60 less illegal campers along the river. I mean, there's just certain things that are are going to be too hard to, first of all, gather the data, and and um, I I don't know. I just I just want to make a comment. I mean, I, I don't think we should look too far ahead on this and expect answers for everything. I just make the comment that I think it's. Um Sometimes you have to be, uh, you don't know the answer yet, but you're aspirational. You're aspirational, as Chris and Mike said, about that if you, if you work in this direction, it'll help with this other part of what's going on in our community. So I'm going to call on this and say let's vote on it. Could you repeat it, please? Uh, yeah. Um, city manager shall help. Build community understanding of the programs through education and outreach, and staff uh, and the city manager will work with community groups, neighborhoods, and residents to clarify purposes of the programs and dispel misunderstandings, especially by showing the video. That's pretty detailed, but okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate. So there's six in favor and none in opposition. It passes. Next. Uh, two more. I'll combine the second or the third, second and third bullets. Um, each councilor shall establish a committee of interested parties in each ward to identify and propose at least one location suitable for the programs. Membership should include, but would not be limited to, neighborhood associations, neighborhood school representatives, and, and area businesses. And we direct the city manager to work with the committees to identify eligible properties to, in each ward putting forward site recommendations for community feedback, council consideration, and approval. Second. Moved and seconded. I've got 
Mike, did you have your hand? Uh, up? Kai's about was about halfway up. I, I think this is this is the one where I think we need to have a little bit more work, more discussion and work session before we're ready to do that. I, I don't push back on the idea that that I like Chris. I, happy to work with with folks in the in the area but what's going to happen I, I i know at least in my word is that there's going to be some discussions about who has the authority to do what and when and where and how and why and make decisions i i think it needs a little further clear and there's going to be a lot of questions about how this impacts what happens further down the road that we're going to need to be ready to answer so i i really think we need another work session before we're ready for this one Claire. Um, I would be all right with having a follow-up work session to dig in a little bit more to this piece, um, but I just wanted to offer um, folks from the Whitaker Community Council have been very explicit that they are willing, or at least one member of them, uh, to be ambassadors to other neighborhood groups or these working groups if we establish them and to go and talk to folks about what they've learned about the pros and cons of the rest stop and how it's... Um, been a part of their neighborhood for the last three years. So I just wanted to let you know that they've offered themselves as a resource in that way. Alan, could you read the motion one more time, please? Um, each city councilor shall establish a committee of interested parties in each ward to identify and propose at least one location suitable for the programs. Membership shouldn't. That's, that's the part. Identify and propose. That does not mean to establish. Because I can see council has to do that. I can I know, but I can see a process getting started where the right questions are asked, where people are not given an opportunity to answer one. Well, yeah. they're kind of forced to answer in a certain way, and it takes them down a road that they really don't want to go on. Mm -hmm. uh, I had that experience with the Coburg Road BRT Steering Committee back in 2002. So I just wanted to be real careful about the wording on that, and I just wanted to get it clarified. And, and the second half of it says that the, they'll put forward yeah. for, yeah. for council action. Thank you. I was just going to mention that um, if you wanted to have an additional work session or at least an additional vote on this, what I think I'm hearing from the majority of you is there's an intent to want to uh, expand this pilot program out of Ward 7 into some of the others. And... Um, what I guess I would propose is that we come back with a couple of places to start because the reality is we're not going to be able, the way that's worded right now, it sounds like we're going to go work with each of you right now in each of your areas and we, we aren't going to be able to do that. And so starting with one or two wards would probably be the best mm -hmm. first step to take. And I don't know whether we could, if you could do a motion around your intent and we could come back with, and this is where we propose to start. I, I so agree with that because I, I, as I said earlier, what I feel is you don't want people pushing back on you before you even get started. You really want to come at them as something that you're, you're working together from ward to ward in your own in your own place in your own capacity, and you want to make this be their decision, uh, not our imposing this. And I think we've just got to come at it in a way that doesn't doesn't feel that way. An intention to disperse means that's what we want to do. Now we want to talk to you about how the, how we can make that happen. Yeah. I think that's a far different thing than to say we're coming. I'm, I, I'm, I just want to um, encourage you to think about that. I have just a little bit more time. And the other Sorry. point, the other point I, I wanted to, to hit upon was we're, this motion is talking about getting the neighborhoods and everybody involved in this, but we don't know what the criteria is going to be. Mm -hmm. So. You know, are we putting the cart before the horse? Because we're also d talking about changing, possibly changing some of the criteria. So we need to be careful about more time on the how to yeah. do it. Yeah. Claire? Oh, I didn't Mike, need, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I don't know who's first. I've got Alan. Claire was. I, okay, Claire. And, oh, then me. and then you, Mike. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it might be premature to jump into this piece uh, for all wards. And I think the first motion, or the just prior motion we passed of education outreach should start to happen 
uh, in advance. Exactly, yeah. in advance. In, in, and we know we've got some neighborhood associations that are stepping up and saying we, we want to be part of this. So perhaps we don't need this particular motion today, um, and we can take advantage of that energy in the community that currently exists and the commitments that we've heard from uh, to start that work in a way that's organic and uh, that works in in um, cooperation with neighbors who are already coming to us to say we want to do this. I've got um, and it, and it was, uh, Mike. Yep. Did Alan's motion get a second? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. I, then rules I move to. Uh, I, boy, I'm having a moment. Substitute. Substitute. Thank you very much, Mary. I move to substitute the motion to say. Um, Move to direct the manager to come back to council at the earliest possible convenience with a work session to talk about how we implement an effective dispersal policy. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Six in, fa and, uh, six in favor, none in opposition. Yes. So now that motion is now, now on the table. On again. And you yeah. vote on it again. That is the motion. So now we're going to vote on it again. All those in favor, please indicate. Six in favor and none in opposition. It passes. Thank you. Okay, that's good. And the final one related to uh, the last bullet, which is um, move that we recognize that social services and homeless activity are more concentrated in Ward 7 and therefore move at least one of existing rest stops to one of the newly identified sites. I'll second it. Moved and seconded. Uh, George? Um, I'm not going to support that. I, I say why subtract them? I mean, let's come up. I, I, I think that just sends us backwards by 20 people instead of forwards by 20 people. I, the, the most pressing issue right now is, the way I understand it, is finding a place for Nightingale, because their site, um, it turned, well, the, the contract runs out on February 17th, I believe. Um, so, you know, so let's say we find a site in another ward, and then we move one from Ward 7. Well, I guess Nightingale would be from Ward 7. But um, that's, that's the most pressing need and and also that kind of um, makes it even more critical and these other things we've been talking about about getting the list of addresses for at least the city owned property because one or more of those might be um, suitable well we don't know unless we can look at the list can I speak to that really quickly? Uh -huh. So when we start working with neighborhoods, we can certainly provide more detail about where sites are located. Because we're talking about city-owned property that isn't developed, most of them don't have addresses. They are only uh -huh. identified by tax lot. So that's why we haven't, we don't have that list for you, but we can certainly provide a map and other detail that would help indicate where they're located. Yeah, that would okay. be good because, yeah, a map would be great because, you know, even as description like well it's between 18th and 16th it doesn't have an address it's a field or it's an old story site or an old you know something and then a dot on the map would be great thank you thank you mayor i, I understand my colleague and uh, would agree that i think we need to have the first work session first before we start moving and I don't want to characterize it as backwards or forwards, but um, there's there's another piece here too that as we have the next work session I want us to, to talk about and it pretend it it's connected to the motion we're in. Um, one of the other locations that I'm sure you'll be bringing back up again that we have discussed previously for Nightingale was the place in my ward near the Fred Meyer, right? There's some legal pieces here that it seems don't all, they apply in other circumstances. There are legal pieces that apply where anybody else who would normally be building housing is constrained from doing so that don't constrain these camps. I want us to be talking about that more specifically. For example, in that particular place I mentioned, there's an eWeb substation within 200 feet of the particular area where people would be camping. 
and there are health concerns around that. And so that's one of the reasons the, the, the statutes and the ordinance exist about distance when you create housing from substations. So why would it be okay for the camp and not okay for housing? I, I want that to be presented by staff when we have this conversation. I want to hear, we know that it, you know, this is different than what we would do if we were normally providing any other kind of housing, but here's why we're going to do it anyway. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, I will support this motion. I don't know that it'll have the votes to pass, but I think it would represent a, a good faith um, acknowledgement of the concerns we've heard from Whitaker neighbors. Um, and Nightingale Health Sanctuary does need to move, and we don't expect it to be replaced at that site. So in, in a sense, that would kind of be a cheat, but it would fulfill the, the requirements of the motion. Um, and I have some concerns about the rest stop that's right next to the railroad tracks and the health and well-being of the folks at that site. I've never really been happy with that location. They may, they may be happy there, and, and that's good, but I don't find it a very ideal location for human beings to live. Um, so that, that's part of the reasons I will support this motion. Okay, we're ready to vote on this one. All those in favor, please indicate. One, two, three. All those in opposition? One, two, three. So let me think about this. Um, I didn't expect that. No, I didn't. Um, hmm. I feel very, um, very supportive of uh, Whitaker neighborhood. I feel very supportive of, of a, actually a, a clear understanding of the same concerns that people have in other neighborhoods are they have in Whitaker. They're not different than other neighborhoods. They're the same. I had a discussion in Washington, D.C. this week about uh, sometimes people put things in a certain part of the community and don't think that those people value their property or have this, the same concerns, and that just doesn't work for people. So I have that. I'm going to go with this just because I want us to really look at the dispersal policy, but I agree with you that you um, that what we don't want to do is lose ground. So I do agree with you on that, but I will vote in favor of it, Chris. Yeah, and part of my support to your point was um, I see the Nightingale um, as being a ticking clock right. that has to be dealt with. And so part of my support was to say we got to we got to find an alternative location for that. And I think once we get that taken care of, we can then continue the conversation about about how to continue on. But I wanted to get that one taken care of. And and I almost thought about offering a substitute motion that was very specific about the ticking clock on the Nightingale space. But I think we'll be OK with this one, I think. But I, I also heard the conversation around not wanting to lose ground so that's think, that's important I also think it, so it, we did have a my, mine was a yes, yes vote um, I also think yes. it's an important message to give to a community that I happen to live in um, that really has felt the uh, they appreciate the rest stops they appreciate Opportunity Village but they do think that if we're all trying to address the unmet needs of unhoused people in our community, everybody should be stepping up, not just a few of us. And so I feel uh, very strongly about saying thank you to that neighborhood for taking on so much and so well for such a long time. And now we need to push forward. So thank you all very much. And I uh, hope you have enough you have more than enough information to go on, right? Yeah, I think we'll uh, we'll sit down and kind of map out what we think we understand and make sure that we run that back by you. I don't, I'm don't. i not going to venture to do that right at this moment. Okay. Oh. All right. We'll be back as soon as possible with a work session on how to implement that. <laughs> Thank we'll you right all very much. <laughs> <laughs> These mini commercials.